right, let's get going. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Tourism Business Council of South Africa webinar. My name is Natalia, and I'm going to be handling all the tech behind the scenes today. This TBCSA virtual session is an industry-wide event aimed at giving you an overview of where our tourism and travel sector stands and what our options are going forward. I'm very pleased to have the chair of the Tourism Business Council, Blackie Kamani, with us today, as well as CEO Chifiwa Chivengwa joining us to give us this overview. You'll also see David Frost, the chair of the Tourism Business Council Board COVID-19 subcommittee and SATSA CEO. He will be moderating the session. Before we begin, we do not have government on this call and we cannot answer on their behalf as to the rationality of the regulations on travel and specifically how they compare to the regulations for other sectors. I personally feel the same way many of you do about this, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. We will be taking questions during today's session and we've received many already. Thank you for sending those through. We'd love to get some more during the webinar. Please place those in the Q&A folder below. Type your question and it will come straight through to me. I'm also going to leave the chat open for now, so please feel free to let us know where you are connecting from. I'm going to stress, though, that I will only be able to look at questions in the Q&A. So please pose your questions in the Q&A, not on the chat, as I won't be able to flick between the two. A personal little ask directly from me to you is to keep that chat tidy and constructive. If you read my LinkedIn post last week, you'll know I'm as hopping mad as you are, but this is about mapping a way forward, not getting lost in frustration. So if the chat gets overwhelming and I can't focus, I'm going to ask your forgiveness ahead of time and I'll disable it. It's really not what I wanna do, so let's keep it tidy. We are also recording this webinar, which will be released to everyone who registered and the wider tourism industry. So thank you again for joining us today. Questions in the Q&A and chat, let us know where you are connecting from. On that note, allow me to hand over to David Frost, who will be moderating the session. David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Natalia, and good afternoon to everyone joining us, um, colleagues, comrades in the tourism industry. Guys, we find ourselves in a, in a particularly dire um, uh, position. Um, things are not great, but we, we have a team that is engaging and will continue to engage on your behalf in terms of our objective, which is to open up the sector as soon as possible, as safely as possible. In, a, in, a, in, a, in an incredibly positive uh, trajectory. We're also fortunate to have Chafiwa Chavenga with us. When I say fortunate, I mean, this is our job, guys. So, I mean, we go through the platitudes, but we're here to talk to you. Chief is the CEO and of the TBCSA, and the work that he's been doing over the past months has been exemplary. I mean, this is, this is, this is body on the line stuff. But we're not here, guys, to recriminate. We're not here to, um, you know, be murderless and, and try to... Uh, hope going in the future, but realistic hope. And it's important that we, that we hold on to hope. When, when hope leaves, rationality goes very quickly with it. Um, we think that there is a way forward in this. Um, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. A lot of what you see is the public interface. But as I say, the lobbying efforts and the conversations that go on behind the scenes continue and, and are continuing at, at quite a pace. It's, it's very difficult to be able to convey every cut and thrust of that lobbying effort to um, the broader tourism community, both uh, you know, members of the TVCSA and indeed um, for those of you joining us outside the fold. But what we are doing today is really having a, a state of the industry webinar and you're going to hear a really um, you know, factual, no holes barred account from both Blackie and Chief in terms of where we are, but they are also going to share with you our way forward. And I want to give you guys a real sense of hope that there is a there is a concerted plan, there is a team in place that is acting on your behalf. And even though we're not getting the the sort of immediate wins that we were hoping for, this these conversations um, are going to continue and will continue um, indeed with your input going forward. So 
that's really enough from me. I'm going to come back and be moderating the, uh, the Q&A session. And we're going to leave at least the second hour of the uh, session for that thing. So we can really get into your questions and address them. Some of which will be addressed in, in um, the presentation and the, uh, um, um, from Blackie and Chief. But we've, we've noted some of the big ones and we'll, we'll, we'll return to them. So conscious of time. Lucky, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, please uh, give, us, give us your insights. And then after that, um, we'll move on to Chief. Thank you, David. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Natalia for organizing this and David for moderating this. Um, Chief for joining us and uh, being our soldier on the ground. I think for me and the TBCC, this is an opportune moment to deal with facts and data. And uh, everything that we'll talk about here will be based on facts as we know them today. And all of us will agree that um, this crisis is a moving target. The answer we might have today might not be relevant tomorrow. And uh, this crisis has no boundaries. It affects uh, both the supply side of our sector as well as the demand side of the sector. And it affects big businesses like Torves, where I'm a deputy group CEO, and small businesses. So there's no, it's not going to spare anyone uh, the way things are going. You know, all of us thought that um, when this started in March, we thought that ah, it's a matter of a few weeks and we'll be back to normal. Uh, boy, oh boy, were we wrong. And the longer it stays, the less hope we have. And I think to David's point to talk about how do we restore hope in our industry. Um, I'm not about to give false, false hopes. I'm about to give hope based on facts and what we're doing. So there's no easy solution to this and uh, there's no pre-cooked answers uh, to our crisis. We've, uh, none of us who are living today have experienced a crisis of this magnitude. I personally, and, and Chief, I think Chief was, uh, was based in New York when 9-11 hit. We thought that that was a crisis. And David will recall immediately put an advisory board who dealt with the crisis. And we thought that that was a big crisis. And uh, I was based in Miami when the Gulf War started, when uh, George Bush II uh, um, invaded uh, uh, the, the Gulf. And uh, our phones in our office at Carol Travel uh, came to a standstill. The phones were not ringing, and we thought that was a crisis. And as if that's not enough, uh, when um, uh, Ebola hit um, West Africa, I was setting up a, a duty-free store in Lagos, and we thought that, that that was a crisis until we're confronted by uh, COVID-19. So the point I'm making is that our industry gets hit by the crisis. But one thing that is constant, we've always come back and be stronger. We all know that we'll recover from this. The question is when? And I think that's what's killing all of us. And anyone who has answers who can tell you that they have answers as to when we'll go back to normality is not telling the truth. There's no such thing. You can work around the processes, um, projected timelines, but there's no definitive chance as to when we can go back to normality. So the purpose of today's session for us as TBC is to give you an update as to where we are, uh, uh, starting from, and what we have been doing starting from uh, March 18th, when the disaster management uh, regulation kicked in. So as, as TPCSA and our, and our members, the various associations, um, as such are included, 
we adopted a three-pronged strategy because we realized that the only way we can get out of this when you don't have answers, you don't have solutions, is to create a process. And hopefully that process will lead you to solutions. Some of the solutions might be wrong, some of the solutions might, might be right. So the, pre, the three prong strategy that we, ad we adopted, we anchored those uh, in PR, which Chief will talk about, the CO. We anchor that on engagement, direct engagement with the government, being the policy makers. And the third leg, which we added later on, was the, the legal aspect of uh, our uh, 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 strategy in, in the process of looking for a solution. But throughout this, uh, the key thing for us was to make sure that we are in tune with what the health requirements are as an industry, because this is a health crisis. It's not an economic crisis, it's a health crisis that uh, precipitated into an economic crisis, but it started as a health crisis. So we needed to make sure that whatever we do, that we're in tune with the various ministries, including the Minister of Health. So what we have done, uh, the first point of call as TPCSA was to call for a, a meeting with the Minister of Tourism and understand the situation as best as we can, given the facts that were available at the time. And uh, we kind of were probably in denial to think that, oh, by focus, we should be over this. And uh, the answer is absolutely no, we're not going to be over this by August. But by then we said, how do we go, how do we go forward to uh, try and uh, lessen the impact of this crisis, both on health, on economy, and on the social and the social impact of this. So we did some work and uh, when you realize that we're not getting anywhere, we thought that we need to elevate our um, uh, engagement with government. So we met with the Minister of Health, we designed uh, world-class uh, protocols, which Chief will talk about. Those protocols are, are self-regulated. And the purpose of this is that you don't want protocols that are governed, uh, regulated by the government. And Chief will talk more uh, about that. We met with the economic cluster. And uh, the economic cluster, because this thing is starting to, was at that point, and uh, you know, it started, we started to see a trend that the job losses were inevitable. So we met with the Minister of Finance, we met with uh, the Chairman of the ANC, who was also sitting in the economic cluster, to say that we have a crisis in our hands. People are, you know, companies are struggling, and uh, job losses are unavoidable. And uh, from there, we uh, ramp up our campaign. We met with the president of South Africa. And unfortunately for us, or fortunately for us, the president, those of you who have listened to the State of the Nations that she has, he has addressed, which is about, I think there's about two of them, where he talked about tourism as being the catalyst industry. So we, we had a receptive uh, uh, president uh, to our call. And just reminding you that in terms of the research justice strategy that the government has put forward, tourism was um, only going to start uh, operating at level two and one. So our plea to the president was that, you know, we don't have that time. People are losing jobs, companies are closing, there's no money whatsoever, and you can't operate a business with uh, zero revenue. And uh, the president listened to us, said he'll do something. And uh, yes, there are aspects of tourism that were open. Not all of them, because as I say, at the end of the day, there's, these are difficult policy choices. You have health, you have economy to balance. And that's what we got from the president. And subsequent to that, we uh, met with the uh, tourism, the portfolio committee on tourism. David and Chief were party to that discussion, and we started talking about what are the next steps. Because you know, when you're dealing with a moving target, you can't sit, you can't stand still. You need to look at what are the next things that you can do 
understanding that the big price for us is to open the inbound market. Uh, the domestic market will carry us through up to a certain point, but the inbound is a big, is a big price uh, for, for our country. And parallel to that, uh, through David's initi initiative, we engage with the Australians, the New Zealand, the equivalent of TBCSA, and we're really getting a good insight as to what, um, what's happening. And the last big engagement that we had uh, was with the banks. We met with all uh, five, uh, four or five big banks, being Standard Bank, APSA, FNB, uh, RNB, and uh, there was one, uh, and NetBank. And really to say to the banks, tourism is in trouble. You know, when uh, companies come and approach you for help, what's your view? We're not asking you to approve anything. And we're meeting with the heads of the CIB, the Corporate Investment Banking, to say, what's your view of tourism? How will you uh, deal with tourism? Where do you rank tourism? Is it seen as a high risk, seen as a low risk, medium risk? Are you open to talking to, to uh, tourism players? And the feedback that we got was that, yes, the banks are open, but you know, banks are banks. Um, and the reason we did that was when we, re we realized that the test money, which um, uh, Chief will talk, to, to talk about, is not adequate. The fact of the matter is that TES has run out of money. Uh, it was meant to be a three month thing. That three month is over. And uh, there's no money that is going to come from the government. And as I said, David was quite right. We're not government, we're private private sector driven organization, but we can tell you facts as we know them, as we get them from the government. And uh, Chief will talk more about that. So in recent developments, we all know what happened uh, about two or three weeks ago when um, uh, there was one of the, the uh, requests we made to the government was to open domestic leisure travel. And that, had, that created a life of its own. It created so much confusion. There was, yeah, it, it became a dog's breakfast to put it mildly. So after the president made the announcement uh, about a week ago, and when we realized that uh, domestic leisure travel was uh, not going to be opened. Um, as TBC say, we called a meeting with the minister uh, to find out what's happening. And it was in that meeting that became clear that uh, domestic leisure travel is not going to open. And um, but we have exhausted all the engagement. And this will lead me to the discussion as to and where are we in engaging the third leg of our strategy, which is the legal side. But I'll, I'll, I'll keep that last. But in our engagement with the minister, one of the things that we, we agreed on was to set up a private sector, public sector driven team. Uh, that will deal with technical issues. And I'm not sure if David, you have that structure. If you have, you can, you can, you can put it up and you can talk about it. But it's underneath it that, okay, good. This joint team, which will be made up of um, 50% people from the private sector, 50% people from the public sector will drive all of these issues. The domestic, the outbound, the inbound, the protocols, make sure that those protocols are endorsed by the UNWTO. Uh, on the inbound side, the aviation, because we need airlines to, 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 to fly in. The financial relief, part of what we've agreed with the minister is that we need the Minister of Tourism, the Minister of Finance, Tito Mboweni, who was uh, the chairman of TBCC before I took over, uh, to go and meet with the banks together with us as a private sector. And 
at least come up with some financial finance financial relief for the sector. And when it comes to the legacy issues, those are legacy issues of transformation, issues of e-visas, issues of NPTR. We mustn't forget about those uh, issues. So that's what this technical team is going to be dealing with. And uh, the last spend of this technical team, my view is that probably you're looking at about two to three years of its existence. It's not going to be a short-term thing, but at least for the first time now, when issues goes to the National uh, Coronavirus Command Council, at least they will have a direct input from, um, from um, uh, our team. You can, you can move it now, David. So, and parallel to that, we have scheduled um, uh, uh, engagements with the Minister, the Minister of Tourism, and those engagements will take a, a form of bigger, broader engagements and smaller focus engagements where we can work with the ministry and the minister. The fact is, I know, you know, they, 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 they sometimes when you're at war, they, there's times where you, you, you don't, you're not sure who's on your side and who's, um, who's not on your side. In this particular case, the Minister of Tourism is on site. And uh, we work with her, she makes herself available. As TBC say, anyone can call her. And uh, she might not have the answers, but at least so far for us, uh, she, has, uh, she has allowed us to have an engagement with her in search of this solution. So given that despite everything we've done, uh, we found ourselves not able to uh, operate uh, domestic leisure travel. So as a, as a TPCSA board, we convened, I think it was last Monday, and decided on the next steps. And these are not easy decisions, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We agree that as, as TPCSA, we're going to look at the legal route. We, we don't take these things uh, lightly. As I say, these are tough decisions because they can backfire and they can backfire in a big time. You've got to deliberate, you've got to be thoughtful about what the possible outcomes can be. And um, so with that, we appointed a law firm, a black uh, law firm, and I'll explain, I'll explain the decision behind that. And also we said we needed a senior counsel who's highly technical and understand the constitutional law. So we appointed a company called TGR and we appointed a senior counsel by the name of Gilbert Marcus. Because when you go to go to war with the government, you need to be prepared. The government, there was a case um, that was uh, presided over by Judge um, uh, Norman Davis. The government lost, but the feedback that we got is that the government is well prepared for these cases. And our brief to the senior council is very, very specific. It's not about why are the taxes doing this? Why is so-and-so allowed to operate? Those issues have no legal significance whatsoever. The issue that we said to the, uh, to the council is that look at section three, uh, 392E, which deals with domestic leisure travel, and give us an opinion on that. On getting that specific opinion, which I think we'll do before the end of this week, the board will convene and make a decision whether to go forward uh, and uh, launch a court application or look at other options. So I'm, at, I'm, I'm emphasizing this point precisely because there's so many theories there. You can go in, win the government. You've got to think about the possible outcome. Even if you win on section uh, 392, if the government appeals, and the earliest you can get to the SCA is in nine months or in 12 months. It means that the entire leisure travel 
uh, uh, for accommodation is frozen. You can't touch it until such time that matter has appeared. So those are the, the, the parameters under which uh, that uh, we brief uh, the senior council because we don't want to put the industry at risk. We want to open up the industry, but without being blind fighters to the extent that in by March next year, you can't even operate, not because the matter is closed, but because the matter is still sub duty care. So in our engagement with the senior council, we're quite confident that we're going to get an honest opinion. We're going to get a factual opinion. And then as a board, we'll decide on the next steps. And those next steps, as I say, they have to be driven by facts. They have to be driven by legal imperatives. They have, be, they have to be driven by the realities that we're dealing with as we know them today. David, I'm going to pause, pause there. I know that, you know, as I say, when you talk about legal issues, you know, economic justification, no one questions that. What we need to do is, a, what we need to get is a strong legal argument that will take us home. But I'll pause there and uh, I'll let, uh, I'll hand over back to you. But again, once again, thank you so much for the opportunity. As I say, these are not tough, these are tough times and there are no easy solutions. Thank you so much. Lucky, thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks for just being, you know, in your inimitable way, being, being sort of frank and uh, incredibly forthright with, um, with um, all of us. And before I hand over to the Chief, I mean, we have had questions coming in, you know, but, you know, we only announced this thing on Fridays. Lucky like said, we, we're in an incredibly fluid situation, we're trying to give timeliest feedback to, to people who need it. But just for a point of clarification, there, 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 are, there are people out there who are not part of um, associations who somehow have conflated the Tourism Business Council with government. We, we are the peak private sector body. We are constituted through all the major associations that span the entire gamut of the industry. We also have individual um, companies that are members of it. And we represent, um, if you look at the spread, around 15,000 enterprises in tourism. And yes, there are people who are not part of associations who um, also, also sort of need a voice. But I think it's imperative that those voices, you know, because I can, I can quite easily step outside any forum and just shout really loudly and bang my box. But it's just me. And I'm always interested that if somebody's coming, that you come with a constructive point of view and that you show me that you have a reasonable constituency behind you, that it's not just your angry two pence that's being uh, peddled, sort of peddled out there. And this is the work that associations do. And I can only speak for Satsa. We, we've been in this thing. We've got incredible support from our members. It's, it's exemplified in terms of the fact that we've got 80% of our members have paid their fees today. Into, even in, in terms of this incredibly difficult financial um, situation. And equally, the Tourism Business Council is doing exemplary work. Guys, this is as good as it gets. This is who we are. We've got a game plan. There's a considered bunch of people working behind this. And to the naysayers, and there are those out there, my suggestion is to you, give us, give us the alternative way forward. Because so far, I haven't seen it. I see a lot of whinging and moaning out there and, and um, sort of negative, negative stuff being put out. So I'm going to park that for the moment, um, but I think it's important for me to say that because what we have here, guys, is a government. And ultimately, if we want this opened up, the only people that can make that decision is at the moment is the National Command Council. So what we need to do is we need to go in with interesting and differentiated conversations that are data-driven and ever us to do successful work, but it is our approach and what we're putting forward is incorrect. We need to find different ways of having those conversations. And as Blackie has said, the decision to look at a legal option is not um, one that one goes to lightly, but it's certainly one that we are entertaining. And but. What a lot of people in the private sector don't realize is that we, in the private sector, when you take somebody to court, you stop speaking to them. I mean, hence the portentous term, I'll see you in court. So
So you stop talking and it all happens in court. In the political realm, which is what we engaged in here, is we keep, we keep conversations open on other fronts. And what, what, the, what the legal challenge may, may end up being reversing the government, but it doesn't preclude the fact that we are still engaging on other levels. And as Blackie has eloquently set out, we've negotiated a proper structured engagement that we will put forward to government in which we can bring evidence-led arguments to the table that are minuted and that the whole process becomes accountable and transparent in a sense. So that's what we're trying to achieve at, achieve at this stage. But look, there, there are a lot of questions out there um, and there are a lot of operational things and Chief has been in the fray on many of these. So let's turn, let's turn to him and uh, Chief, please, please uh, um, share with the members where, where, um, an update from your perspective. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here and uh, talking to the industry colleagues. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind uh, that all of us are frustrated. There is no doubt one bit. Uh, and equally so, there is no doubt in my mind uh, that uh, our staff, you know, are also frustrated, especially this month when you don't even have you know, the tears money that will come in and there are many that may not have, uh, you know, any money or any savings to put food, you know, on the table. There's no doubt in my mind. I talk to a lot of people, a lot of young people also contact me directly, asking for advice, asking uh, for, you know, what is it that we do? Uh, we are in this together. And we can only go through this together and we can only come out of this together. Uh, and I think that there is no time uh, to really pull sideways uh, because when you start to pull sideways, uh, that's when the cracks start to, start to show. And the, when the cracks start to show, then the weaknesses are there. And uh, you know, people know where to hit if they want you know, to destroy the pillar. So it's quite important that, you know, when we pull, we pull forward together. We all have the same goals here. The end goal is that we want to see our employees going back to work. We want to see our companies uh, going back to work. Uh, I always say that recovery starts when that one employee goes back to work and they're able to put food on the table. That's when recovery starts. That's when we start to see difference in communities. Uh, that we operate in and the communities that we serve. When our employees come back to work, that's when the difference starts. We're not, we're not going to make any profits. I shouldn't even be talking about profits. We, sh we are not going to even make revenues to break even, uh, you know, anytime soon. But what we want is that, you know, let's, let's start greasing the wheels of the value chain of tourism, you know, by, you know, the little business that we can get you know, so that, you know, uh, the spiders don't go in there and start to have all these cobwebs and, and by the time we open the doors, they are squeaky and, uh, you know, we have to restart again and to redo, you know, uh, the work that we've done. So we are in this together and uh, we are here to work for you. Uh, there are no egos. We do what we're supposed to do. It's not always easy, uh, but we're up for the task. Uh, and it is something that we have elected to do. Uh, and it's something that, you know, we're passionate about. We all are tourism professionals. Uh, and, it, you know, at this time, things are very, very tough. Uh, and uh, we know that, you know, our livelihoods are being destroyed. Now, just to get into the details of things and to add to what the chairman have said, there's a great deal of lobbying that, uh, that happened and still continues. Uh, and you can imagine, you know, when you're doing this lobbying for the past three months, uh, you have meetings in the morning, you have meetings throughout the night. You talk to various ministers, you present the case for tourism. And it's true that tourism, when the risk adjusted strategy was, was, was put out, it's true that tourism was supposed to open on level two uh, and on level one. When we went and met with the president, it was to plead the case for tourism that it should be opened immediately. We pleaded for you know, domestic leisure travel, we pleaded for restaurants, sit-down restaurants to open, for casinos, 
Uh, we pleaded uh, even prior to that for airlines to start operating and so, some of these things happened. But there were bigger items that we were pleading for that unfortunately did not happen and still is not happening. We all know the frustration that we went through, the flip-flopping, uh, the tweets that comes and say leisure accommodation is allowed. The next day the tweets are pulled out. The, the different interpretation of regulations uh, you know, that we have been talking about to say, you know, these regulations are not right, this, you know, and, and we put our foot down to say we're going to continue to operate. And we were right, you know, in interpreting those regulations. Unfortunately, in the last uh, regulation that was uh, gazetted, uh, the matter for domestic leisure was taken out. Of course, that's frustrating for all of us. Uh, and, you know, my job and everyone's job is to carry the frustration of the industry and communicate those frustrations. And that's why you would have seen the, the large PR, you know, that we have done around this. Uh, we have spoken in many levels. We have consulted widely. I know that, you know, the regulation as they came out, uh, you know, we want to talk about what about this one, what about that one, what about the opening of this, what about the opening of that. One of the things that we, we, we have to always be careful of is to argue against ourselves. Uh, we go and argue that casinos are open, then we go and argue why are they open and, and, and you know, why aren't we not open? So there are many things that don't make any sense. We get it, it, it it's nonsensical, uh, it's, you know, we look at it, it's irrational, uh, and no one can explain it and say, well, you know, this makes sense. So it's important, you know, that in the quest of solving this, we do so, you know, in a very calculated and in a manner that we win. And that's why the was missing the issue around, you know, the legal going to court if we're not going to win. Uh, we're going to weaken ourselves further. So we need to make sure that we get the best legal minds to deal with the issue and tell us exactly what the outcome would be if we go to court. Now, in the process of what we've been doing, we got involved with the UIF uh, and uh, the TS program. Uh, this has been a pain for everyone. Uh, it's been a pain for me. I've, I've dealt with many cases that came uh, uh, at my desk. And, uh, you know, without any justification whatsoever why they're still outstanding. Uh, I talked to the commissioner even yesterday to say, well, why are these cases still outstanding? What's missing? Because we submitted everything. So there seemed to be a systematic failure uh, on their part. Uh, and it seems uh, as if, you know, they're struggling to meet the demands, you know, that are put before them. However, what we are told is that, um, you know, everyone uh, that has applied for the past three months will be paid. When that's going to happen, we don't have the full timeline on when that's going to happen. So that is at least something that, uh, 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 you know, we know is going to happen. It's painful. I know. You know, I deal with the... I, I call the commissioner every day. Sometimes I go through, sometimes I don't go through. I know there are people, your employees, you know, who don't trust you and say, well, you know, we don't know if you, you really applied for the TS program. You know, or some of them will come and say, you're holding back our money. Uh, I know I deal with this every day and it's something that's a problem and we're hoping that sooner, uh, if not later, you know, these things will be dealt with and we'll, we'll, we'll move on from this. Do we need more TS program? Yes, we do. We know that our industry is not going to recover tomorrow. Even if you open the borders and we say, let's go back to normalcy, it's not that tomorrow people are just going to get in their vehicles, uh, you know, from here domestically to go around. Inbound, it even needs more lead time. And we've presented these things. And that is why at the end of all this presentation, uh, you know, we, we've decided to go legal on, the, on that side. But for the TS program, we have raised the issue even with the president to say we need this to be extended because our industry is it's, 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 uh, it's the one that's worst hit. We talked to the president and said, uh, even the portfolio committee say, well, let's extend the TS program you know, further for, for the industry. Portfolio committee, the president, all the ministers, we have met with the minister of labor, everyone that we could meet with, we have met with them. And we have explained the case of tourism to all these authorities. Now, are we still continue to engage with UIF? Yes, we are, because you know, maybe we'll be lucky. And maybe our luck is gonna come in when, you know, maybe UIF can say, you know, they can do something for us. But so far, there's nothing 
that they can do for us. They're saying that there's no money. Now, if I were to move on from the issue uh, of uh, the TS program uh, and uh, you know, touch a little bit on the, uh, I've spoken about the engagement. There are many meetings that we've had and the, the chairman have spoken about that. Uh, the PR, I've spoken about that. The legal matter is the consequences of the engagement that we've had and the fact that uh, uh, you know, we feel that you know, we, we're not being heard adequately. Now, we as, as, as the industry, we are not government and we know that. Neither do we appoint the president and neither do we appoint the ministers. We work with what we are given. I know that there's a lot of frustrations about government, about this minister, that minister, the president and so forth and so on. We are a private sector. We work with the minister as a conduit and a political representative, you know, to government. Uh, and we don't have any other minister of tourism. We have one minister of tourism and that's the minister that we work with. All this matter still needs to be decided by government and they need to be approved by government. So that's, that's, that's another issue because I've seen many communications uh, that talks about, you know, the political, you know, let's remove the minister. We, we are not government. What we do is to advocate for the industry and to make sure that we are apolitical uh, and we deal with the issues around tourism and make sure that we solve the issues of tourism. Uh, and I always say that, you know, I'll be, I'll raise my hand. The day we start the tourism uh, political party, I'm there. Uh, I'll raise my hand and, uh, you know, I will make sure that I become an MP. But at the moment, what we're dealing with, we need to solve the issues that we have through the channels that we have, including the legal channel. Because legal channel is, again, talking to the government uh, in a legal way. Now, th there's a lot of people who would say, you know, is, is this a wise choice and everything else? Go legal. I mean, we have done all the communications. Uh, at some point, after you've communicated and you feel that, you know, you need to take another, uh, you know, route, I think, you know, it's time that we take that route, but it, it must be tested before we take it and make sure that, uh, you know, we, we win. As the TBCSA, we represent the vast number of associations, from the travel agents, you know, association through ASATA to SACI, uh, the conference organizations, uh, to Fed Hasa, uh, the hotels and the hospitality. Uh, the list goes down to the bed and breakfast, uh, the car rentals, uh, the hunting associations, the airlines, both domestic and international. Uh, the value chain goes on and on and on and on. And I may not have mentioned everyone, but we have about 12 associations that covers you know, everyone around, you know, uh, uh, you know, the country. Do we represent everyone? No, we never said we represent everyone, but we believe that we represent the majority. And we believe that our duty is to the industry, yourselves, to make sure that, you know, we can feedback and tell you what's going on, uh, regardless of whether one is a member or not. The decisions that are taken are taken by the board, which is led by uh, the chairman. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's representative. And uh, it's not a decision that, you know, one just takes lightly. They are debated. We make sure that, you know, uh, everyone's views are taken into consideration, especially from various constituents, uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, we are not just, uh, uh, you know, doing things that are, that are, you know, sideways. The biggest two prizes that we want is to get domestic travel to work. The next one is to get international inbound to work. Those are the two big things that we, we want. The rest will follow and it will fall in place if we're allowed to work. And I believe, as I've said, recovery starts when people go back to work. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Okay, guys, sure. It's, uh, there's been a, look, there's a lot to di digest out of that as well, but um, the message is clear. You know, we, we will continue to engage and indeed we have to, as I say, it's the only way this thing's gonna open up is if government has a different view on us and we've got to present a case that is compelling um, on that. So there've been a number of uh, questions that have come in. One of them I wanna just kick off because I, um, we spoke about a number of things. We spoke about an ongoing dialogue and we are, we are going to pursue that through a proper structured engagement. And, and you know, 
why is that important? So, and I'll tell you why, just for me, and I was, you know, I put this to the minister when we, when we met her recently. And it's about, because there've been a lot of questions here, guys, about motives and what's happening. And let me tell you what's not helpful to us. What's not helpful to us is if we get into um, conjecture and conspiratorial um, uh, um, speculation, because that finds its way through to the command council. And when the minister goes into bat for us, people say to her, but the industry is not behind you. So we need to present a, a, a case here, guys, that, and however frustrated and mudderless we get from time to time, we've got to keep the eye on the donut and not the hole. And that is to get opened up. So part of what that structured engagement is about is about getting definitive common objectives. And as I said, just know and trust our objective, the TBCSA's objective is how do we open up the sector as soon as possible, as safely as possible. And we need to put that there so everybody knows that, that is the tourism sector's objective. The health sector has got a different objective. Their objective is you know, to keep people safe and to manage the pandemic. Our, our objective is to get our, is to get, um, our sector opened up and, and uh, uh, moving forward. Um, and, but, so we've got the structured engagement. There's the legal um, case that's coming back, and I'm going to come back to Blackie. There have been one or two questions on that. But um, I think it was Russell from Sony Lodge Backpackers sort of spoke about, can we not get a social media campaign together? And I just want to share with you through Natalia something that we are putting together. We're in the process of launching this. And Natalia, and we've got a PR collective team that came out of the inbound recovery uh, working group, which is part of the TBCSA, um, and did a lot of really good work around South Africa's travel ready and just getting that notion out there that we are we are working towards opening up. But we want to launch a new social media campaign that is a positive campaign that puts the light fair, squarely on the value of tourism in our economy and vulnerable groups within that. And it's a whole campaign built around women in tourism. Natalia, do you want to just share with us a little bit around that campaign? You're asking me to multitask. I'm dealing with chats and WhatsApps and Cura Days and all the rest of it. <laughs> but I'll do my level best. And I actually want to just um, give a bit of a shout out to the whole industry that's gotten behind the South Africa is Travel Ready message. You guys have embraced it. You guys have pushed it. And my hearty, hearty thanks for doing that. We've been running that campaign for the last month and a half. Um, I do have a PowerPoint, but I'm not going to belabor it with you. This is just going to be a very simple update on what it is that we need to do. Because like everything in COVID, we have to pivot. We've recognized that tourism as it stands, the message that South Africa is travel ready might not be getting through the way that it needs to get through. And so what we have done is we have tried to understand how we can get the message listened to at the highest level. Now, government's stated approach, government's stated a, a narrative and focus is around inclusive growth of the economy. And that is very heavily focused on women and on youth. We know as a tourism and travel industry that we have about 70% of people who are employed in this industry who are women and 60% who are youth. More than that, we have the ability to um, bring onto, stre onto stream the SMMEs and we have the ability to employ people who have low skills or no skills in rural areas. So we need to make sure that that message gets across. We have subsequently launched a campaign called I Am Tourism. I Am Tourism, and that falls with, within our South Africa is Travel Ready campaign that our media collective has been running over the last month. And that basically brings a voice to those women who are affected in tourism by linking them up with women who have a voice in civil society, in government, in business, in tourism. So bringing the human face of the lockdown to bear so that individuals within the government sector can see this human face of livelihoods lost. But over and above that, as irritating as I know you and I both find surveys, all of the surveys we have run in tourism have been around the tourism industry, but they do not drill down the impact to women and to youth. So I have put out another survey and I am deeply sorry for having to get you to do another survey for me, but I need stats because if I don't have the stats that give the human story some gravitas and I don't have the human stories to give the stats some gravitas, 
I don't have a strong message to go out with media. So I'm going to ask you, and thank you to those 600 companies that have already completed that survey in the last two days. I really appreciate it. I'm going to ask you to complete another survey for me. I also want you to go to the traveltosouthafrica.org website, and we will paste the link in the chat, traveltosouthafrica.org website. All the information on how you can do something yourself today, five things you can do today to get us singing from the same hymn sheet, walking in the same direction, so that people take us seriously instead of running off in a million directions. We cannot be seen to be reactive. We have to respond as one collective and we have to do this strongly. So get behind that South Africa's travel ready message. Get behind the I am tourism. We wanna see women holding up placards. I am tourism. This is, this is the time for us to get involved and to collaborate. And for those men who are feeling out and are feeling like I'm being sexist by marginalizing them, can I just say that this is not about you. This is about making sure that a message that is being heard at highest government level is heard. And it's through women, unfortunately for you. So get behind your sisters and help us spread the message that I am tourism and that South Africa is travel ready. Thank you, Natalia. So just feeding off that, um, so let me, you know, we'll sort of, you know, start with this one, Blackie in Chief, in terms of sort of questions. So a lot of people are obviously feeling incredibly, you know, frustrated and, and coming to the end of their tether. So we've started to see uh, organic protest, um, you know, springing up. There was this sort of incredibly, you know, powerful, you know, all the OSV um, operators in uh, Mpumalanga got out and there was a big convoy there. There's talk of a, on Wednesday, there's a big restaurant um, protest that's sort of going, sort of going out. And indeed, um, other, other, other of these sort of protests being sort of planned. What is your advice and what is your take on it? Could you just sort of, you know, talk to the, uh, to the people on the webinar and just give us your, your sense of how do we, how do we manage um, these things and feeding of what Natalia said, you know, how do we keep these positive so that whatever we do actually has a chance of, of uh, reaching the end goal and doesn't bedevil, end up bedeviling our um, efforts? Can I, can I go for this one, David? Okay. I think, I think uh, and thanks for this, and uh, I think th th those are relevant questions. You know, in terms of crisis, we all look for possible solutions. And I've been watching um, questions coming out of my screen. You know, people say, how can we help? What can we do? And, you know, those are positive questions. I think, uh, David, you, you touched on this. You know, what helps us is when these positive campaigns that focus on opening the industry. You know, we mustn't sidetrack and be confused at what it is that we're looking for. We want to save the industry. We want to open. You know, if we positively focus on that, we're helping the minister when she approaches the command council. Because we're not there. When the minister stands up and talks to the national command council, and then has to take the matter to the cabinet. You must remember that she's facing the Minister of Health. She's facing the Minister of Police. She's facing uh, all other ministers with competing interests. And what, does, what doesn't make her life easy is when we seem to be attacking the very person who represents us. As Chief said, we're private sector. We can influence policy. We don't make policy. So when the minister stands up, she needs to know that the industry is supporting the stands up, she fights for us. She's not going to win every battle with all this competition. You know, going back to your question about the protests, it's our constitutional right to protest, but those protests have to be done in a disciplined manner that is not destructive. What doesn't help is when the Minister of Police and when the Minister presents, uh, the Minister of Tourism presents, and the Minister of Police say, says to the Command Council, look, what this, this is what your industry is doing. 
and you're asking us to give further concessions uh, to the industry. It doesn't help our cause. So to your point uh, that we need, to, we need uh, to keep the pressure as part of the PR, but it has to be done in a disciplined manner and in a positive manner. I mean, you can't fault the campaign that Natalia is putting, uh, is, is, is putting together, uh, except that this element of discrimination there, you're not including men. Uh, I feel hurt for that, but it's a great campaign. We need to do more of those campaigns that are positive, talking to the issues of opening our industry, talking to the issues of the economic impact, the hardship, that this closure has done uh, to our industry. So I don't think, you know, where things go wrong is when you start seeing uh, things that are outside opening the industry, you know, th those things don't help us. If, whether it's economic debate or legal debate, those issues will never help us at all. Thanks, Blackie. Um, so could I move on to sort of dealing with, and I mean, we're trying to sort of bundle as many questions as we can, guys. So, just to perhaps, you know, a question that sort of reflects on, our, on, 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 on the possible legal sort of challenge. There was a question around, have we given thought to looking at a more differentiated approach to um, either geographically or by different segments to look at a more sort of risk adjusted approach to, to that, to put that forward in um, some way. And perhaps in, in, and then also somebody also said, can you just talk through what the possible timelines might look like on this. And then associated with that, you know, perhaps you could just weave it in because they're, they're, you know, as people feel desperate and they feel as though, you know, this thing, you know, we're not winning, they feel as though their, their segment or their part of tourism is not being heard. So we'll say, well, the kayak paddlers aren't being heard or the, the golf tourism guys aren't being heard or the game lodge guys aren't being heard. Could you just respond to that, and, you know, perhaps in, in the sense of, of uh, looking at a possible differentiated approach, or is, is, there, is there scope for that? Uh, Chief or Blackie, I mean, you guys. Uh, um, I'll, let, I'll let Shift go on this one. Yeah. So uh, I'll try to be visible, because others were saying I'm not visible. So it's just me, it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not the camera. Anyway, but you can hear me. Um, one of the things that's quite important uh, is that uh, in moving forward, there may be a need, you know, to differentiate. There may be a need to differentiate. Now, what we have done so far is to say, you know, when we say domestic travel, we mean everyone, be it accommodation, be it a adventure, be it a B and B community tourism, everyone that does domestic travel. When we say inbound, everyone that does inbound. And by the way, the large part of domestic travel is business travel, uh, you know, which is organized through the travel management companies. So, so when we talk about domestic, we're talking about everyone else. When we talk about uh, 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 international, we're talking about everyone else who deals with international and those that deals with the issues here on the ground. So, so that's quite important that, uh, you know, when we do so, uh, we are able to, to open up the entire value chain, you know, of tourism. Of course, you know, within the domestic and the international inbound, there's conferences, uh, there's many other things that are, that, are, that are involved, and there's a whole value chain that goes through that. Now, um, in, in, in moving forward, there may be a need, and I said maybe a need to differentiate the risk you know, of, of, of various, you know, subsectors of our industry. For example, what is the risk factor of, uh, of game lodges? What is the risk factor of B&Bs? What is the, the risk factors of hotels? And this is where you may want to say that, uh, you know, you, you look at it to, and I'm going to make this as an example, you know, when someone says 70% loading capacity for long distance and say, you know, 100% for short distance, that's kind of, you know, uh, those differentiation on the basis of distance to say you are able to do certain things. Or let's say in a hotel space, you say, well, you can have a 40% occupancy. Or in a lodge, you can have 100% occupancy. In a camp, you can have 100%. Leisure, uh, if you want to take a boat, for example, uh, and do uh, water activities, you can have 
you know, the same as the transport, you know, regulation. Uh, this can apply to various, you know, places where, you know, uh, each subsector, be it OSV vehicles, be it buses, you know, be it, uh, you know, kumis, and many other people that operate, you know, within the value chain of tourism. We should be able to put different risk, you know, uh, factors uh, to be able to open. And, and if we do that, it, it will be a strategy to say, how do we open certain aspects faster so that not everything is lumped up in one? Uh, because it's easier to just say accommodation should not open. But if we say, well, we've got five types of accommodation, and these are the risks associated with the five types of accommodation, well, on the basis of the information that we get, then we're able to sort of de-risk, you know, various subsectors. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, it will require that, you know, we, we are very disciplined and we do things in a way that, uh, uh, you know, we're able to get answers and we're able to win, uh, you know, when government looks at these things. So there is an opportunity to do that. We're looking at that very closely uh, to make sure that certain aspects of our industry, uh, you know, are op keep open. So far, we have business travel open. We know that conferences are allowed for 50 people. We know that is not enough. Uh, how do we make sure that we put a case for increasing from 50 to 100 to, to 500? Because certain venues are bigger uh, and they should be able to accommodate more people you know, in those particular venues. So those are the kind of things that we're going to look at so that we can break down our industry into smaller chunks and get things to, to, to be approved. We all know that airlines are, operate, are operational. Uh, they seem to be uh, uh, the Minister of, 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 of Transport, although not fully, uh, it seems to be not talking about the capacity on the airplanes, which is good. It means that even when we deal with international, we don't have to climb that mountain of talking about capacity and whether this is doable or not doable. So we are looking into that. It's part of you know, the forward-looking strategy to say, how do we then, as part of the engagement with government, you know, to start to, to put things in chance? Yes, you know, can we talk to government through legal means? We can. And I, I want to emphasize something. We, we didn't say that we are going to court. We said that we're exploring legal options that we will then de, you know, decide on whether we should go ahead with a court case or not. And if we go ahead with a court case, it should be based on merits and the board will decide on going ahead you know, with the court case. So that's why we talk about exploring our options. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that we've decided on what options you know, uh, we're gonna be taking. Let's first get the legal opinion and then we'll deal with the matter as, as, as and when it arrives. It's easier uh, and, and I'm as mad as everyone else. You know, believe me, you know, I want to go to court as in yesterday. I want to sit in front of the judge, I want to present the case. But it has to be a considered case. Uh, because when I sit in front of the judge, and, and, and we all have to learn this, and many of you have gone to court. You know, I, I, I go there with my emotions, you know, I understand the industry, I want it to open. This doesn't make sense, Texas, this and that. And, 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 and when the guys advise you, those who are not close to the process, then they start to ask you questions. And then you start to think like, well, maybe I may be thinking of this emotionally. And rightfully so. We have to be emotional about these things. It's our industry after all, uh, and we, we want it to open. And I'm, I'm unapologetic about being emotional about it. So, yes, you know, we may have to, to digest the industry into smaller chunks to make sure that, you know, we get things done and to make sure that uh, we are able to... Uh, to get certain things operational and, you know, few more people going, going back to work as we climb this ladder. It's going to be, um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big ladder to climb. And sometimes it can be uh, very, very tough. But uh, we, we are resolute in, in, in making sure that we reach the top. Thanks, Chief. Lucky, anything to add on that or should I? So one of the no, I'm fine. I think Chief covered everything. Yeah, no, I think I think you did it well. So look, one of the questions coming in is that um, really asking Blackie, maybe you can you can you can take this one is is um, around what data the government is is uh, using to make its decisions, and is there any way to try and get some feedback from the National Command Council as to the reasons that they are um, not opening up? Um, our sector as uh, as we are asking it um, to be opened up. So perhaps you could you could sort of try and deal with that. 
Thanks, David. Um, we asked the Minister of Health the same question when we uh, met with him. And uh, they are informed by scientists. And I think there are about, there's a group of 60 scientists that inform the decisions. And those decisions are factored in, it's, it's kind of a matrix that goes to the command council. But absolutely, you know, it's part of the ongoing engagement. And as Mr. May, so they they use you. So can we? We're more than happy to create that access and get someone to tell us the numbers. You know what informs these decisions, because you know, as I say, when the minister, um, when we met with the minister, he made it clear to us that he is advised by the scientists, and uh, that whole process goes through a technical team, from technical team goes to the command council, from command council goes to the cabinet for a final decision. So yeah, it's a 60 scientist, so there about, um, the number might be wrong, but the, 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 there is science behind the decisions on the health risk, not on other issues, on what's, what's the projection you know, going forward? What, what will the impact of doing A to X what, what are the possible outcomes? And that's what informs the decision. Chief, perhaps I could just come to you now for there's one of the questions we got in earlier on. Um, and I mean, you, you did touch on it, but maybe just some, some, some more sort of details. There seems to be um, a sense of a little bit of confusion and almost um, stasis that we've got a bit bogged down on the issue of protocols. And we put a lot of work into developing these. Where, where do we stand on the protocol issue? And do you see that as a possible way of also sort of advancing the argument? Well, the, the protocols that we have developed are developed by the industry. Uh, they are owned by the industry. Uh, they were vetted by uh, an epidemiologist. We presented these protocols to the Department of Health, uh, to, the, to, to the guys that we work with on many other aspects. Uh, they were also presented to the Minister of Health when you talked to him, I looked at them and together with the Deputy Minister of Health and many other people that are involved uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, travel, um, you know, trying to open the, the travel safely. Now, the protocols, I know that there was an article that was written yesterday that says that, you know, the protocols, you know, are yet to be approved. Uh, it, it talks about yet to be approved by government. You know, I just want to reiterate, there's never been any government department so far that have done protocols and released protocols to the industry. The reason is that, you know, government cannot, if government puts together protocols, if anything goes wrong, it means that a person can sue government. That's why even on our protocols, there's a disclaimer on those protocols, you know, that says that, you know, you have the responsibility of implementing them. Uh, we don't want the patrons to, uh, to come back and say, well, you know, I came to your place and then I believe I got the virus when I was at the place and therefore I'm going to go after TPCS and government. If government goes and gazette this, it means that there has to be a mechanism of monitoring this and there has to be a mechanism of saying if you breach, you know, what would be the punishment? So this is, you know, uh, the protocols are, you know, industry, you know, standard. Uh, and it's a self-regulation mechanism. There's a team that works on protocols uh, that's led by uh, Lee Zama from Fedasa, who's one of our board members. Uh, she works with everyone in terms of making sure that, you know, these protocols, the ever-changing nature of this regulation, you know, uh, is inputted onto the protocols and we ensure that, uh, uh, you know, we don't miss things that may be a legal requirement that came from the Department of Labor uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, the protocol team has uh, many people coming from various areas uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, business. Uh, and its job is to make sure that we, we keep this document, you know, up to date. We monitor the developments. Uh, so it's a self-regulation mechanism. We, we have subjected these protocols to WTTC, World uh, uh, Travel and Tourism Council. 
uh, and they have given us uh, a go ahead to, to put um, uh, you know, their stamp uh, after they've looked at the protocols. Uh, and I'm sure that you know, when the minister was saying that you know, they need to be approved by government or uh, be subjected to you know, international organizations, she was probably talking about UNWTO, uh, which can only be done by you know, government itself to submit them there and get a stamp from UNWTO. So the protocols are effective, they're in use. Uh, everyone is uh, free to use the protocols. If you develop your own protocols that are up to standard with uh, the Department of Health and WTO and every, everywhere else, you, you'd be free to use your own protocols. Uh, and, uh, you know, for us uh, is to ensure that we de-risk the sector. And it's through those protocols that we're able to get certain things open. Uh, and uh, and uh, this was decided at the, uh, at the TBCSA board that we need to to do these protocols, as the chairman have said. And we've done the work, we're able to open certain aspects. And of course, we still need to open other aspects that we all know what those are. Uh, I've spoken about leisure travel, uh, because uh, they are being in use now for business travel, they are in use for conferences. Uh, those who go to offices, they are in use, you know, when people go to offices in terms of protocols for the offices. Uh, and so forth and so on, you know, camping and many, many other places, including car rentals, the entire value chain of, of the travel and tourism. So that's where we are. Uh, we are moving ahead. So the issue around protocol is done, is dusted, it's ever-changing document. Whenever there's something new that we're going to put and announce, we will do so. But so far, we're moving ahead with those. Uh, and uh, if government wants to subject them to UNWTO, uh, even better. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to stop using them. It doesn't mean that uh, they are not approved. They are approved. Uh, we are using them. We have been using them for months. And let's continue to use them and show that we are a responsible sector. Thanks, Chief. There have been some questions coming in around um, looking at the region and would we be looking at a regional opening up as a precursor to an international inbound? opening up. Um, so let me handle that one. And there were also some questions around interaction with SA Tourism. So just on the, on the regional and the international um, side of things, the main push has been, in, in terms of the immediate guys, is to get the domestic side opened up. And, you know, clearly we, uh, you know, we got pushback in terms of, of uh, not getting what we wanted. And we, you know, we've been Depending on, on how we're going to attack that. But what's been happening um, concomitantly, and, and which is, you know, at the same time as we're doing all of this other stuff, is we've set up a really high powered inbound working um, team. A lot of the work they did informed the, what was presented to the portfolio committee in early June. That strategy has now been advanced. It's moving into sort of away from, well not away from, I mean certainly a key part of it is the economic arguments around why we need to open up the opportunity cost of not opening up, but we need to get into the specifics of how, so that when you sit down in front of whether it's Blackie and the team of leaders to the president or the minister, that we get into the detail of how this can happen safely. So there is, um, and, and, and that strategy is almost is almost 95% um, complete. But I will say this, there is an incredibly fluid situation internationally. I mean, some countries, particularly in Europe and areas of Europe that have opened up are now pulling back. I mean, it moves every day. So linked into that inbound strategy is also a detailed aviation access strategy, because we've got to, you know, access is only going to happen if we can get airlines um, to fly in. And in order to fly in, you've got to be economical, I mean, economic in terms of your inbound traffic, but you've also got to twin that with outbound, um, outbound traffic. So there is a detailed strategy on that. And we will be feeding that back to you, the industry collectively in the next, in the next fortnight to give you guys a sense of what the strategy is. And also very importantly, to get any inputs that we might be missing um, from that strategy. But as part of that, there's also a very, you know, there's a, there's a big regional component on that. And we've had a number of uh, interactions with our regional um, colleagues around that. And it's, a, and I mean, let me tell you, those are very interesting conversations because 
there's a very different situation in Zambia to Zimbabwe and then particularly to Namibia. I mean, Namibia is almost like our New Zealand. They've had very few cases. It's an incredibly sparsely populated country. They're looking at, uh, you know, twinning with bubbles in uh, Europe. But we continue to have those sort of conversations. But equally, and I know there are a lot of people on the webinar that are based in the region. And um, South Africa in the main is the main uh, international air access hub into the region as well. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of work in that. So that regional component forms, forms an important part of our strategy, but it's an, incredi it's an incredibly fluid um, sort of situation that, 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 that you know, we, we monitor almost on a sort of daily basis and the strategy gets sort of adjusted um, accordingly. Equally, guys, what we've got to be cognizant of, and perhaps we haven't spoken about it enough, and I might ask Blackie to weigh in when I'm finished, is, you know, we started, as Blackie said, we started at the start of this, and, you know, we, we were looking quite good numbers-wise. The rest of the world was at higher sort of levels. And, you know, just in the last sort of two to three weeks, we've really ramped up. And, I mean, we are in the thick of it now. Um, and that, that in itself also informs... Um, uh, government sort of view of it, and it does sort of, in a sense, hand the initiative to the health hawks. You know, it it you know the sort of lives versus livelihood side. It sort of swings to the, it sort of swings to the other side, which is in, which which is why it's so imperative that we keep the conversation going, that we feed real time information into the minister. We think we can do it in a much better and improved way with this with this structured engagement, and that brings me to the point that you guys raised about. SA Tourism. We did, um, in the in initial start, have, have a very good interaction with, um, with sort of SAT, and that process has been, been a little distended of, of late. But with the structured engagement that Blackie put up, we see that we will have a fundamental role to twin and partner with SAT in a number of those working groups. And if you have a look at the inbound working group, the main focus is how do we open that as soon as possible, as safely as possible. But moving forward, there have been really good indications from SAT that we, we need to do things in an entirely different way moving forward. And in terms of how the marketing gets done, where it gets done, they really want to partner with us fundamentally about how we, how we actually, how we actually um, do, that, do that sort of thing together. But Blackie, do you want to just perhaps, there have been some questions coming in around, you know, you talked about the minister going into bat with us the situation we find ourselves in, in terms of the sort of COVID storm. And, you know, just to try and perhaps sort of speak through that, you know, you know, where does, you know, where's the minister getting information from? You know, is she, is she really on side? Perhaps just, I, you know, I think just because of the magnitude of questions, perhaps just have another go at, at, um, at, at expounding on that one. Thanks, David. I think, um, Maybe to uh, latch on what you said uh, earlier on, uh, David. You know, this is this is a moving target, and uh, you know when we when this whole thing started, the health uh, cluster uh, was in control. Then, as the numbers of uh, infection dropped. Uh, the economic cluster, you know, got involved and things were moving forward. And that, that was at the time that we met with the president. And uh, hence we got these concessions. And Chief makes a point that, you know, the reason why we got these concessions is two, three things. One, the numbers were showing positive or negative growth or slow growth. Secondly, we managed to unpack the, the, in the sector into various components so that you know there's high risk, low risk, and, and medium risk. So we've done that successfully. But the, the other thing is that the, um, the, the, the job losses were starting to, 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 to really uh, uh, hit at home. So you know we, we had an opportunity there. Where things are today is that we, we see the numbers. As I say, when we started, we mustn't forget this is a health matter. And a part of it is that when um, we talk now, and so all of us in this conversation know someone who has been, in, uh, uh, who has been affected, someone who has tested positive, all of us. 
Now, in the past, when the command council was discussing, it was a distance thing, it was based on projections. Now you sit next to someone who said, I've lost my family member, I've lost my loved one on this. So it doesn't get easy. Is it going to be, are we going to manage to get over this? Absolutely. But we have to be uh, sensitive to the fact that it's not getting easy. The, as, as numbers grow, it makes it difficult for any concessions to be given to us. But going back to Chip's point, you know, we've learned a few lessons here. One, if you bundle tourism as a whole sector, you're going to get a no. But if you break it down into its bite-sized chance, we're likely to, uh, to succeed. So that's, that's, you know, part of this ongoing engagement is saying, when it comes to domestic tourism, what are the elements of it that we can use to test, uh, to prove that our protocols will help to flatten the curve, that where, when you open, you're not going to uh, add to the increasing numbers. So create that level of confidence and comfort from the government that you know this sector will act responsible and this sector will make sure that there's compliance. Because we mustn't forget that we're dealing with a psychological barrier here. You know, tourism is seen as was negative, you know, people are traveling. You need to make sure that you deal with that uh, aspect. The second aspect of it is the educational aspect. To say, you know, you need to make sure that the government understands that there are, sector, there are segments of the sector that are safe. So, you know, unless you overcome those uh, barriers, you know, you, you're not going to go, go get anywhere. But our minister gets it. And I can say that, you know, I'm not on a payroll, I work for a big company, but when you go to war, you must know who your allies are. If you fight your own allies, you're going to have a problem. As I say, I'll go back, you know, in one of the sessions, and David, you were there when the minister said, when I talk to the industry, I'm seen as with the government and not with the sector. When I go and talk to the government, the National Command Center, sec, uh, Command Center, they see me as someone who represents the sector. So I'm kind of caught in the middle. So what we have managed to achieve with this is that we support here, hence these concessions that we have, got, we have gotten. Is it enough? Absolutely no. But in the game of strategy, you need psychological victories. As long as, as, long as every day we're making progress. And the three-pronged approach that we have used, with Steve pushing in the media, the PR, talking about the plight of the industry, talking about the socio-economic impact of the delayed opening, talking about the cost of not opening. That's his role, to create that um, a, a, a media push. The second thing, the, 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 the structured engagement that we talked about, we need to push more of that so that we support the minister. The legal, the legal challenge is, is an option that we are exploring. If we, if we get to a stage where we find that uh, this thing is not going to take us home, we'll stop it. The board will make that decision. But we cannot, in good faith, not look, look at that as an option, as a responsible board that is there to represent our members. So David, I mean, to, to, to your point, what can we do? We need to support um, the people who are fighting for us. And through that structured engagement, I hope the industry will come behind the minister. Yeah. Thanks, Blackie. And then just, you know, just speaking of that, um, question from Julie Molyneux, um, who's joining us from overseas, obviously, but just saying, you know, we're an overseas operator. We see what's going on. How, you know, how can we help? Well, Judy, one of the ways that we would, we would value your help. We need to create, but we need to convey, not create, we need to convey the data and the argument um, that there is demand out there. You know, we've managed to, in a very precarious way, hang on to our forward book. We, we've put forward a date um, in terms of our engagement with government, in terms of inbound opening around the 1st of September. We've got to be realistic about that. Um, but we will continue to push for that. But Julie, as from overseas, and we will be having a inbound strategy um, sector specifically designed for the overseas market as well. But 
what we need from you is data and um, uh, uh, information that speaks to a, a continued appetite um, for South Africa. Um, but please engage us. We can, we can, you know, through Natalia, perhaps in the in the um, sort of chat side, you could just put up our, our email address where where anybody from overseas can can engage with us and 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 send data. But also, just want to give people the sense there've been a lot of interesting and very useful suggestions coming forward. We might not be able to respond to all the questions, but we certainly are are sort of taking note of those. Um, so maybe, um, Blackie, just a quickie for you and then on to Chief. So I've got two questions. Timeline for the, for the sort of structured engagement and steering committees. And then Chief, um, interministerial lobbying. And, you know, how do we get the rest of the ministers and how do we try and look, at, uh, look for other allies in other ministries? All right, you want me to come in there? Okay, so yeah, go 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 ahead, Chief. So so the issue around interministerial lobby uh, is something that we have done um, and will continue to do. Uh, I've said that we have spoken to the Minister of uh, Health, including the Deputy. Uh, we have spoken to Minister of Finance. We have spoken to the um, Economic Cluster Ministers. Uh, um, Gone all the way to the president. Now, the issue that you know, of course, frustrating on the surface, and, and and I understand this from everyone. The issue that's frustrating on the surface is that you know, when you look at what has happened, it seems or it appears or it is true that you know other sectors are being looked at different, you know, to our sector. That's what's frustrating. That's what I'm getting from. A lot of questions that I'm seeing. Why are the taxes operating? Why are the you know uh, this is working, this is not working? Why is mining happening? Now, when you deal with these issues, and 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 it's legitimate frustrations because on each one of us, is, you know, we're looking at you know what are the legitimate reasons for those things to work, uh, you know, and why are they allowed you know to work? And those are legitimate questions. And, and those are the questions, you know, that are, that are based on the, uh, you know, what are the principles that are being applied to mitigate the spread of the virus? And why, what is it that we can do to implement the very same principles that those sectors are doing, you know, to mitigate the spread of the virus? So one can say, you know, we've got our protocols, we can do this, we have business travelers, why can't we have leisure travelers? Uh, one can say restaurants are open. Why can't we have people in the vehicle? Those are all legitimate questions. And those are the things that we're dealing with on a day to day basis. And we need to refine and make sure that we deal risk by beats and, beats and charts. So the, the, the engagement with other ministries remains important. Like I said, and, uh, and, and, and I've said this in the past, we don't decide who's the minister of what. It, it's not our job. Our job is to work with what we are given because we're not a political party. Uh, and and uh, I'm going to say this again, we don't decide who is the Minister of Tourism or who is not the Minister of Tourism. It is the cabinet, it is the, the, the ANC or whomever is the president, whoever decides, decides. And we as, you know, the industry practitioners, we work with anyone that's being put in front of us. I know that a lot of people have asked questions about, you know, uh, you know, the knowledge of the tourism industry and, and so forth and so on. Well, it's our job to educate them and we'll do our best to educate them because ministers uh, come from the political arena. Uh, they're politicians. We are the, the specialists in our sector and part of our job is to educate. But what we cannot do uh, is, to, is to have uh, a notion of, you know, change this, change that, change that. Uh, you know, it's a political decision and we ask out of that. So we talk to all ministers, we talk to the Minister of Transport, we talk to the Minister uh, of uh, 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 Environment when it comes to opening the National Parks uh, and many other ministers that are relevant to what we're trying to achieve. Our job is to make sure that we convince them and we put a, a case. And if we put a case and we believe that the case is not being listened to, we consider other options of talking to government that could include legal options. Uh, if it's feasible. 
So, so that we do, we talk to everyone. There are various things that need, still need to be sorted out. E-visas needs to be sorted out. Uh, NPTR needs to be sorted out. Uh, and many other aspects that needs to be sorted out. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's our job to go there and sort those things out. Uh, we have managed to sort some few things last year out. We need to sort more things as we go on. And, and part of what we need to do when we talk about this interaction with these ministers, you know, one of the things that we need to do is make sure that we have as many ministers understanding what tourism is. And, and that's the job that we need to do. They stay, these ministers stay in our hotels, uh, they stay in our resorts, they go to our safari lodges, they do our activities in terms of adventure and many other activities that we do. It's our job that we educate them about the value of tourism you know, and also how many jobs it creates, how many people are dependent on the industry and so forth and so on. It's our job as a sector to do so, to make sure that there is a full understanding of what the sector does. And we should not, you know, uh, really, uh, you know, put our heads down and say, you know, it's all done, we cannot do anything about it and, 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 and so forth and so on. Guys, there's politics, there's industry. We're in the industry side. And we need to make sure that we get this industry opened uh, by whatever means possible that we can get this industry open. So we talk to every ministry. I know that people have been talking about, you know, when is the, the committee going to be set up as soon as possible. Uh, that, that, that is the, the, the short and long answer. It's something that's been worked on immediately. Uh, there will be other committees that will be set up in terms of dealing with the technical issues to make sure that it feeds into uh, uh, you know, this committee. It's not meant to be a big committee because what happens is that if we have too many people, uh, then it becomes debates and debates. So we'll have our debates as, a, as an industry. We take our conclusions of debates, feed into this committee that will then sit with the, with the public sector to make sure that we advance the needs of tourism. Uh, again, not everyone is gonna be included, but we'll make sure that we talk to everyone you know, and we've done so, you know. Uh, some conversations have been good. I've participated in conversations that have been shouted at. Uh, it's okay, it's our job. Uh, invite me again, I will come. You can shout at me. I, believe me, I'll take it and I'll, I'll take what's valid and say, well, you have a point. Like I said, we're all frustrated. We all want answers. We're all working on getting the answers. We all know that there are many things that don't make sense, but we have to keep our heads on it we cannot pull back. We cannot say that we are tired uh, because there's way too many people that are dependent on us. So speaking to the ministers, this committee, setting it up, making sure that you know, we, we, we get all these agents that are sitting at home. You know, I was looking, I was talking to someone today, uh, I think I was talking to Otto, uh, who's one of our board members, uh, about the, 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 the ITC, independent travel agents. They're all sitting at home. There is no business that's going on. They can't sell anything. And majority of this, of this you know, ITC are women. You know, how do we ensure that we talk to all these ministers, we talk to everyone that's involved in the value chain to ensure that you know, we go back to work? Is that important and, and to all of us? And it's, it's, it's critical that we get these things going. So political engagement in terms of talking to the ministers is needed. Uh, do we always win when we talk to the ministers? Not always. Do we get shouted at when we talk to the ministers? Yes, sometimes we do. We get scolded, we get told things about the industry, uh, we get told about things that we need to improve, but we need to keep our heads high and make sure that uh, we produce uh, you know, the results that we want. Thank you, David. I think, David, maybe just to add to what uh, Chief is saying, you know, this um, private public sector, joint committee, uh, maybe to define its role in terms of where it will have an input and where I think it will have an impact. Because it's important it's, you know, to set another committee, that's the easy part. The difficult part is how are you going to measure if this committee is delivering results? Uh, so if you look at the process of the decision, the decision making process of all of these um, input that we, let's say we're asking for domestic uh, leisure travel, 
uh, opening of the borders, interprovincial travel, the way things work, everything goes to a technical team, which is headed by the DG of each department uh, that is relevant. In this case, it will be the DG of tourism. And the other DGs will sit in that technical team. I think going back to Chief's point, how do we bring in other ministries? At the DG level, that technical team will be interfacing with the right, the right people. From that technical team, the submission is made to the National Command Center, which is where all the ministers sit, and the minister relevant, which is the Minister of Tourism, present to the Command Council. After that, once that input is approved, it goes to the cabinet for the final approval. So where this committee that we talk about, that Chief says we should, should, be, we should set that up pretty soon, that its input will be at a technical level with the teachers. And once you get that, if you go past that, at least you probably say it's 65% there in terms of achieving your, your objective. So that, I just want to highlight that, that that's the process that uh, this will follow. And in terms of uh, getting this committee up and right, uh, running, all we need to do, we, we need to write to the minister and say, this is the structure, these are the terms of reference, let's get going on this committee. So we can have it, in fact, we need to have it as soon as possible. Thanks, Becky. Um, let's try and get through some of these other, other questions. Um, I mean, you did touch on it, but I mean, just to like a, like a, let me put it just very clearly to you, Becky and, and, and Chief, should we be joining all the peaceful protests and campaigns? Um, you know, the chairman have, have spoken about this. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's everyone's constitutional right. Um, you know, to, to, to join in. If you join in, make sure that you, you know, you are within the bounds of the law uh, because gatherings are not allowed. Make sure that there's everything that's needed. Um, I know that there's a lot of people who would say that, you know, um, and I'll, I'll give an example. I saw on the, on the questions uh, or on the chats, who would say that, well, we're putting together all this presentation and lobbying government. The taxi industry didn't do that. Uh, they just they just get on the taxi, they block they block the road, and then they get what they want. Each every industry has its own characteristics, um, and uh, you know, us as an industry, probably this is one of the few or the first time that you know some of the people are saying you know we need to go onto the streets. So should should we do so? Let's do it so peacefully. Uh, let's make sure that uh, you know it's uh, you know the characteristics of our industry. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, and, and the integrity, it's, 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 it's proper. Uh, let's make sure that, you know, we don't do things that we always criticize. That's another thing that we need to, 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 to make sure. Because the next thing, when we go and do this, and if, we, and if we do it in a way that we've always been criticizing other sectors for, 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 for protesting, you know, we, we, can, we can no longer have that space to say, you know, the taxi drivers have done it. If they do it and the block, the road, and the tourists cannot get to where they're trying to get to, you know, they will say, well, you did it, you know, the other time. But I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm saying that if it's peaceful, it's your constitutional right. Uh, you know, I've once said that, you know, I, I want to do a walk from here to Venda uh, just to show that, you know, that's my solidarity with the, with the industry, to show that we are committed to this industry. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you do so peacefully and within the bounds of law, why not? You, you, you show your frustrations. I don't think that we can say, you know, no one should go or we can say someone should go. I think we are all professionals. We all know, you know, what we need to be doing. And we all know what's right and what's wrong. Uh, and we should be able to go there uh, if you do go there and, 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 and say what we need to, to say. And I've seen the protests in Pumalanga. I saw they were very well organized, they were peaceful, the cars were in unison, uh, they arrived, they hooted, you know, it shows that, you know, there is frustration. Uh, and if it's done properly and within the bounds of law, well, everyone has a right to do so. Thanks, Chief. Um, le just leading on from that, perhaps you could speak to this, Blackie. Um, 
people are asking why are the unions, why are the trade unions not more outspoken about what's going to happen? Um, obviously, there's going to be a lot of um, sort of jobs being being lost. Um, I know you've had some engagement on that side, but perhaps you wanted to speak to that one. Yes, David. Um, I think it was last week when I spoke to the Deputy, Deputy Secretary General of uh, Sakao. Uh, that's the biggest trade union uh, uh, in our sector. And unfortunately, he was in isolation, so we couldn't get much discuss. And I know on the 22nd, I'm having a discussion with him with the same conversation. And, uh, you know, the issue that we need to uh, 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 approach with them is that it's their members that uh, are being affected. And how can we put a, um, a combined effort as part of the engagement to make sure that we convey the same message uh, to the government? So, you know, we need to, in various ways, I'm sure all of us have relationships with the unions and other uh, uh, organizations, but um, I will carry on my conversation with, uh, with the Deputy Secretary General of uh, uh, Sakao to make sure that we do these things in a structured manner and in a manner that will have an impact on achieving our goal. And you mustn't forget what our goal is here, which is to save the industry. So, David, yeah, to, 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 to your question, uh, you know, asking the same, the same question, you know, what can we do together? He said, look, there's a lot, but we need, I need to, I need to, um, I mean, isolation or quarantine, self or quarantine, but he's coming out, I think he's coming out, he was coming out over the weekend. So on the 22nd, I'll be talking to him again. Thanks, Blackie. Um, we've got about uh, sort of 15 minutes left. We sort of still the questions are sort of coming in. Um, question asking if we can get some sort of consistent feedback on the uh, whole issue of the legal action and, and obviously the sort of results uh, in terms of the structured engagement with um, uh, sort of steering committee and, and interactions with um, government. I think one, one of the questions that was asked um, by someone was, um, what can we do? I th my, my advice is that stay close to your association. And, uh, you know, SATSA and other associations are members of TBCSA, and most of the SCOs serve on our board. So I'm sure at the right time, uh, the outcome of the consultation regarding the legal uh, option, you know, will be out there, they will know what to convey to you. Um, so I, 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 I think with that, you can, um, you can be sure that you'll get some feedback through, through your association. Uh, the second question about the, you know, the pro progress on the technical team. Also, you know, the associations are there, the board of TPCC will know, our members will know, chief as a CEO, will send out communication to all our members to say this is where we are on these issues. So there's constant communication. And um, you know, if need be, and we have, need to have a bigger a feedback session like this, uh, we always appreciate and welcome the opportunity to share what has worked and what has not worked uh, in our process of trying to solve this uh, problem. So yeah, they, 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 you know, stay close to your association. I'm sure there's going to be some, uh, there will be feedback within the next week or so. Thanks, Blackie. Um, just hoping I can sort of, you know, and Natalia, you need to just sort of come in and give us some advice if we are missing anything. There was another question, perhaps this one for you, Chief. What is the chance of us getting further financial relief from government? The 250 million, didn't uh, really go anywhere. But I, you know, without preempting and keen to hear what you have to say, but, you know, in terms of that structured engagement, we've, we are 
going to set up a working group on financial relief or just financial support. And but let me just say something, guys. And you know, in terms of the way you know Blackie sort of um, explained it, to make these things workable. Um, you've got to have a small group of people that goes into bat for us. It will be four or five people representing um, the TBCSA in each working group. But behind that, we can structure ourselves in any way that we want to. So I want to just put a shout out to everybody. Put your lateral thinking caps on. We've, we've got some really good ideas. Um, just you know, the point of departure is, is, is that there's not a lot of money in the cupboard. I mean, the fiscus is, is, is basically dry. So we've got to start thinking laterally. Uh, Brent Dixon from uh, Dream Resort sent in a really interesting idea, and it's around fiscal relief and, you know, playing with tax structures and things like that. So we need to think incredibly laterally, and government is going to look for us to come with the solutions. They don't have the, t I mean, they are not in business. They don't understand it to the same extent we do. So in all these working groups, what we need is we need ideas. We, we have associations. We'll be having uh, webinars like we did in terms of our runway to recovery to end with the protocols to get input. But you've got our email addresses. If you haven't, we'll put them up again. Give us the ideas, guys, because that's what helps us refine our arguments when we go into bat on on your behalf. But Chief, just a comment on you on in terms of any more financial uh, support or relief. Thank you, David. I think indeed uh, the financial relief uh, that was uh, put out of 200 million, uh, obviously that's not enough, um, you know, in terms of giving grants, but it, it did went out to those that were approved uh, and they got the grants and, uh, you know, we believe that, you know, it's going to go a long way for them. Uh, as they continue to try to stay afloat. Uh, now, do we need more money? Of course we need more money. In fact, if we are to keep the industry closed, uh, and if government is saying, well, you cannot operate, one of the things that could have been great is to say, you know, you cannot operate, and this is the subsidy that we're going to be giving you. We all know that, you know, the industry generates around 22 billion rand, uh, per, per month, I think it's 22.7 billion rand. So it would have been great if the government would have said that, you know, here's a 10 billion rand every month as a subsidy to keep you afloat. You're not going to make any profit, you're not going to make anything, but you have money to just get you going and make sure that, you know, the value chain keeps moving. Would have been great, but we are in a situation where uh, from all the, in all accounts, when the Minister of uh, Finance uh, talked about the budget, we all know what happened, the easy money that's there. Uh, we all know the budget of uh, the Department of Tourism was cut by a billion rand, I think about 40, 41%. Uh, we all know what that means. It means that there's less money to, 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 to market tourism. Uh, and we all feel frustrated when the budget of tourism you know, gets cut. We want the department to have enough money so that South African tourism can have enough money to do the marketing. Without that government you know, deposits, it leaves us very vulnerable uh, in terms of uh, in terms of marketing. Now, on the relief side, although government has put together the 300 million uh, bank guarantee loans for businesses to apply, we know that uh, it becomes very, very, um, you know, sometimes it's difficult for businesses. I have heard from businesses that have applied; they managed to get that uh, bank uh, government guarantee loans, and they will use that money, you know, for operation costs going forward. Do we need more money? If yes, we do need more money. The chairman has spoken about the meetings we had with the banks uh, to really talk about the plight of the industry and, and where we are going. Uh, do we need government to put in more money? Absolutely. If the government has money, you know, we, we think that uh, you know, they should put in more money. We are also aware that we're competing with other sectors. We are competing with the social uh, aspects, you know, of... Uh, of the country. Uh, we all know the cases that gets had every day. Uh, we all know what they are. We all, some of us are even supporters of uh, many of social uh, uh, community uh, based, uh, uh, you know, be it uh, uh, for children to go to schools or to go to preschools. We are party to this. Uh, we all know the challenges that we have as a country. But that doesn't mean that we cannot stop trying. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be putting together our best effort you know, to, to get government to look at us differently. Uh, and uh, that's our job, and we're going to keep doing that. 
you know, I wish we, we, we've had, you know, the, the relief like many other countries uh, where, you know, there were relief for restaurants or the discounts for restaurants and so forth and so on. And, and one of the things that uh, perhaps, you know, could be very useful uh, in the future, and we did write a paper about this last year uh, and submitted it to the Minister of Finance as TBCSA, is to say, you know, when, when tourism, if you want tourism to be competitive, we may want to look at, you know, as an example, VET. You know, how can we get less VET for tourism so that it can be more, uh, you know, uh, competitive? Instead of 15%, tourism gets 10% then more people can be, it makes the prices of food to go down, the prices of holiday to go down, and it, it stimulated the demands. Those are the kind of things uh, from the economic point of view, you know, to talk to government about. If there is no money, you know, what are other measures that are non-monetary that, you know, we can take advantage of as an industry to ensure that, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, we, we move the needle from that point of view. So, yes more money is needed. Right, thanks, Chief. Guys, we've got sort of just over seven minutes left. I'm going to just ask Blackie to, if you could, in, in conclusion, just sort of try and wrap it up for us and, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, give us your wrapping up. And then, Chief, I'll come to you after Blackie just to augment it if you, you know, just want to sort of, you know, add to that, but just your concluding message to the industry. I think this has been an incredibly informative session. Um, and it's not easy, you know, we're dealing with high levels of frustration out there. And, in, and indeed, you know, we, I mean, if you hear, you know, me sounding off to chief and backwards and forwards, you know, we're up against it. And it's, it's bloody frustrating when you're not heard and you've put a logical argument forward. But as chiefs just said, we cannot stop trying. So this is our job. We go into bat for you, but um, Blackie, let me uh, let me hand over to you just to just to try and sort of wrap it up for us. Thanks, David, and um, thanks to everyone for listening and really participating uh, in this discussion. And you know, this is what our industry is known for that we not share uh, arm's length um, participant. We are passionate about the industry. We are on the ground. We create jobs where they need it the most in rural areas. We employ um, uh, women and, uh, and, um, and youngsters. And um, so we are the industry that is a catalyst for the economic growth of this country. But in thanking everyone, uh, um, maybe just to highlight a couple of things. I started off talking about uh, our three-pronged uh, strategy. Uh, uh, our commitment to you, I say our is the real way, because Chief and David and others are the ones who are making things happen, is that we will execute on this strategy. And we will communicate back to you on what we're achieving and what we're not achieving. We're going to be driven by data, as always. We're driven by facts. And uh, emotions are not going to, you know, they're good for, they serve a certain purpose. But it's only facts and data that will take us uh, uh, forward. We uh, have always been disciplined in our approach because we want to make sure that whatever we do yield results and that it has an impact. So that's, that's my commitment to you as a chairman of TPCSA. And we all know that, and I said this in the beginning, that the industry will open, but its question is when. And that's a big win. You know, I mentioned that this uh, crisis affects uh, both the supply side and the, uh, and the demand side. So that big win becomes a big issue. You can have the supply side ready, but the demand side is not ready. But above all, don't lose hope. We'll get over this. As painful as it is, we'll get over this. This is something that every day, we deal with is that is how do we get the industry to open this is a daily weekends every day 
and the man you're looking at there, Chief, you know, he has lost his head because we put so much pressure on him as a board to say we need to get the industry to open, but we've got to be realistic in our expectations. So with that, I want to thank you everyone for your time and uh, we'll give you feedback, stay close to your association and more importantly, uh, keep the social distancing and wash your hands. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Blackie. Chief, uh, from, you know, new, as I always used to say in my old sets of newsletter, news from the front. So you, you know, you like the sort of captain who goes over the top in the First World War. So let me uh, have your concluding comments. Thank you, David. I think that um, yeah, it, it's very important that um, we all do this together. We all fight together. Uh, we stick together. Uh, we are one family in tourism. We may have some disagreements here and there uh, where, you know, uh, we may feel that, you know, this aspect or that aspect is more important than the other one. Uh, it is rightfully so. Uh, we can have those, but those are the disagreements that we can have behind closed doors. When we go out there, you know, to government, when we go out there to present our cases, when we go out there, even if we have to go and, and look at other ways of speaking to government, we go there as one, whether you're a member of the TBCSA or you're not the member of TBCSA, the benefits are the same. If we get the industry to open, everyone benefits. More importantly, our staff benefits. And I think that, uh, you know, most of all, we, we've got to make sure that, you know, the entire value chain from those that does rural tourism, community-based tourism, those that do, you know, urban tourism, those that do adventure, those that are involved in, uh, you know, resorts, timeshares, those that are in the car rental space, those that are in a conferencing space and meeting planning that are involved through the value chain, from those that put in lighting and do the decorations, those that cook our food that we eat, uh, the chefs that are out there, the waiters, you know, the people that clean our hotels, those that stand in the front desks, uh, those that drive the shuttle companies, those that are sitting at home uh, being an independent travel consultants, the travel management companies that are devastated because there is no business travel. Uh, those and many, many more, you know, are you know, the family of tourism. And whatever we do, let's do it together so that we can come out of this together. We are in the forefront for you. We work for you. We make sure that you know, people go back to work and the businesses go back to where they were. Where they were. And that's our job and we'll continue to do so. And we'll continue to engage with everyone throughout the village chain, including the airlines, uh, including you know, everyone from the lounges. I can go on and on about the value chain. Those that are sitting at home because airports are not open. You know, the guys that stands there when you arrive at the international arrivals, you know, wearing the orange overalls, you know, the porters, you know, they're sitting at home because there are no tourists coming in. The airports are closed. Uh, so, you know, our work is bigger than us. It is to ensure that those that cannot speak are able to get food on the table. And we do so, you know, not in a selfish way. We do so in a humble way to make sure that we open this industry. We are all devastated, but we've got to keep our heads up and let's push forward together. There's no other way of solving this but to move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. That's so well said. The only way is forward. <laughs> we, can't, we can't retreat out of this. this we, we, we have to keep on going forward. And my message really, uh, firstly, is it's just good to ride with great people like you guys. I mean, if I'm going over the top, I don't, you know, to have you guys on either side of me um, is incredibly uh, um, frozen. But we have had Evelyn asking Chief to run for president, Chief. <laughs> no, I'm not a politician. <laughs> That's what I think on that note, David is frozen. I think He's we can uh, close off. Natalia, what did you do to David? I mean, you uh, can't well, you know, that. he was talking about going over the top, and I thought that's just not something I can deal with <laughs> on Monday afternoon. <laughs> I, 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 th I, th I think you can close, Natalia. <laughs> Okay, my thanks to everyone. We are one minute over our webinar period. I had over 200 questions and I'm so sorry that we weren't able to get to every single question, but hopefully we answered 
as many as we could. I know we did. And I see David is back. David, do you want to have a closing remark? Yeah, thanks. I just, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure who'd, who'd sort of, I thought it was my old friend Kigabu who'd got sort of, got, got involved. But, um, you know, guys, we've been fighting on, we've been fighting on people's behalf now. I mean, I've been in this job for seven and a half years. You know, there is a fight to be had. We've got to, it's, it's, we've got to get the message across. But we're not alone, guys. You know, a lot of people think we're being victimized. You know, spare thoughts for everybody who's involved in um, the booze industry, you know, in all aspects. You know, people involved in the tobacco industry. We're in a, we're in a really weird time. Um, we've got a government that's trying to do, you know, I believe genuinely, you know, people wake up trying to do their best. Is their thinking aligned to us? Not always. And as we say, we get incredibly frustrated. But the only way is forward. The best way to do that is with one voice. The best way to do that is, is in, with coherence. And we've just got to stay positive and keep on um, sort of batting away. Will we use different tactics? Will we try different things? Of course we will. And that's the purpose of this webinar. I think it is incredibly important to take the industry into our confidence. We act on your behalf and we'll be there for you. Should we do this uh, more regularly? I think the answer is definitely um, yes. And through Blackie, we'll, we'll hopefully come back with you on it in terms of a, of, a, of, a, of a timeline commitment on that. But we'll continue to communicate through the associations. I think, they, I think they've done a really good job. Um, and let's make it a two-way street. We, we are always, I get, I get, I mean, I won't tell you how many, but I get numerous emails as does chief every day with people coming up and saying, hey, Dave, have you thought about this? Let's go at it that way. And that's the sort of positive contributions we need. We will prevail in the end. So I thank everybody for their time, uh, both uh, our local uh, um, colleagues as well as everybody who's clocked in from overseas. We have for you guys, we're not giving up and we will prevail. Thank you, David. So on that note, just remember, South Africa is travel ready. I am tourism and I know all of you are as well. So let's spread the word. Thanks again and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.